start by um, continuing the um, proof we were sketching yesterday afternoon. Uh, remember, we are proving what I call the convexity estimates. We have a um, hypersurface flowing by mean curvature flow, which is um, so closed uh, with positive mean curvature. Um, and uh, so the statement is um, uh, for every eta, uh, there exists some constant C eta times uh, uh, su such that uh, the um, smallest curvature is, uh, can be bounded from below by this expression. And uh, for simplicity, I am sketching the proof only in the case uh, n equal 2. And um, we have shown that the estimate is, um, will be a consequence uh, of a uniform bound uh, on a suitable function, which is the following. Okay, um, let me mm, uh, come back in detail to something um, which we were saying yesterday. The, um, the um, an important point of our proof is that we are going, we want to show that F is bounded from above. So it's enough to take care of the positive part of F. So observe that uh, if uh, f is positive, so at a point where, uh, so at, uh, if f is positive at some point and uh, if at a certain point in time f is positive, this means that um, so in two dimension, a square minus h square is uh, uh, minus two, the product of the two curvatures. And then uh, uh, we also have minus uh, eta h square is uh, greater than zero. Uh, so, uh, so this is negative. This means that this is positive. So the product of lambda 1 and lambda 2 must be negative. But since uh, the sum is the mean curvature, which is positive, this implies that uh, um, lambda 1 is negative. Lambda 2 is positive. It is also greater than minus lambda 1. And, um, but we have uh, a... Um, uh, we also have that lambda 1 cannot be uh, too close to 0, must be away from, negative away from 0 by an amount which is uh, comparable to eta. Um, there is um, an important point which I uh, forgot to mention yesterday until the, the question that came at the end. Uh, that is, um, if uh, we have positive H uh, at the beginning, then uh, as I told you at the end uh, by answering one question, um, there is a uniform control between A square and H square. So there exists uh, C0 such that uh, um, A square is less than or equal to C0 H square uh, for all times. Actually, this, uh, this bound is invariant under the flow. So the, the C0, which holds on the initial value, uh, is, uh, gives an estimate which also holds at later times. 
So using this, uh, we can say that uh, um, we, uh, that the lambda one must be uh, large enough. Uh, more precisely, what can we say? We can say that uh, uh, minus two lambda one lambda two is greater than or equal to eta h square, but h square is uh, greater than uh, a square. Um, maybe, yeah. And um, a square is the lambda one square plus lambda two square, so we also have this. And then this means that uh, minus lambda one is uh, greater than uh, um, eta over uh, two, C zero, lambda two. And uh, well, if lambda, uh, we are at a point where lambda one is negative. So lambda two is greater than H at this point. So th this means that we have uh, a um, kind of um, so an, an estimate which reminds the, the pinching that we had in the convex case. That is, uh, when we study uh, convex hypersurfaces as in we can uh, first result, uh, all uh, curvatures uh, satisfy an estimate of this form with their plus. So lambda one is greater than a constant times h. Here we are, uh, the point is that we are considering uh, surfaces which are not necessarily convex. So lambda one can vanish, can become negative. But we um, choose this function in such a way that at the point where we work, we gain a little pinching, which depends on eta. So it will not be uniform in eta, all the constants that appear in the proof, but this is, uh, this is okay because uh, the, um, the statement also gives a constant which depends on eta. This shows that this constant will become larger and larger as eta is small, but this is, uh, this is perfectly okay. Um, so in particular, recall that there was this uh, tensor uh, which appears in the evolution equations uh, and um, it can be proved uh, so that this is um, non-trivial, non but it's a relatively short calculation that is in Huiskan's first paper. That is, uh, so in general, in, in n dimension is, uh, would be greater than this. Uh, here we are, we only have one of these components, so this is uh, just this. And then at points where uh, f is positive, so lambda one is greater than this, so this is uh, greater than uh, eta square plus c zero square h square gradient h square. So th this is an estimate we used uh, yesterday to um, uh, derive LP bounds uh, on uh, this function f. So I recall what was the last estimate of uh, yesterday, which was uh, that the derivative of uh, this, uh, well, let me look back what the coefficients were. So this is, uh, greater than or equal to 
something uh, quadratic in P, then we have these uh, terms, uh, C is a suitable constant depending only on the initial value so that that's C0 which uh, appears there. Uh, sorry? Uh, which exponent? Grad F, uh, it's uh, uh, two. And, um, okay. Okay, this is what I, <laughs> what I wrote yesterday, but um, if you have followed the proof, you realize that um, it's not true written in this form because, uh, well, uh, I write it back in a moment, because uh, the, this estimate hold where f is positive. So uh, this would not be true for um, also the general power of a negative function would not be defined in general. But th this is actually, so my argument works for the positive part of f. So I have to put a plus here. F plus means the positive part of F. Um, if P is, uh, let's say, greater than two, then F to the P, F plus to the P is uh, C2. The, um, the positive power smooths the, um, the, the, um, the corner which is in the, in, at zero for a function like this. So we do not need to interpret this in a weak form. If P, P is going to be very large, so this is a, uh, a function which has all the derivatives uh, which appear here. And um, yeah, so we have uh, this estimate on the positive part of P, uh, of F. And uh, now that the point is, um, to show that this term is uh, less than these other two for suitable choices of P and sigma. And um, so philosophically it's like a Poincaré est estimate, Poincaré inequality, we, we want to show that something without derivatives on a closed manifold can be um, bounded by something with derivatives. Um, but the, the, the point is uh, actually not, um, it's not a matter of uh, uh, um, general inequalities on Poincare type, but comes from a geometric fact. So it comes from uh, uh, specific properties of the objects we are looking. And um, the, the way, um, we can manage this fact that this was um, one of the key ideas in his, uh, pre, in his first paper, was to um, somehow combine terms without derivatives with terms with derivatives, starting from the Simon's identity. So recall uh, uh, Simon's identity, which uh, says that uh, so one of the form of the identity is this one. The Laplace of a full second fundamental form is uh, equal to this expression.
basically this expression is um, a commutation, uh, so you um, compare the Laplace of uh, so Laplace, which is the trace of the Hessian of something uh, uh, without trace. Uh, so you you put the trace on the tensor or on the on the derivatives, uh, and you somehow commute derivatives. So some uh, curvature terms appear by uh, Gauss uh, relations for the curvature tensor, and. Um, so this is something which contains uh, second, so on, the derivatives and zero order term. So the hope is that if we integrate uh, on uh, the surface, we obtain an equality relating uh, zero order terms uh, and uh, terms with derivatives. So the idea is, uh, um, I, so it's a long computation, but it's rather straightforward, so I just uh, sketch the, the main steps. So write uh, um, the Laplace of, uh, of our function f. So our function f uh, contains um, also a square in the numerator. So in the... Um, uh, we're, uh, we replace uh, Laplace a square in the expression of Laplace f uh, by this expression here using uh, Simons. So we obtain, um, so Laplace f equals something. Then we multiply We multiply the, the two members of this uh, equality by this uh, expression, f plus over p times, um, you know, divided by h to the sigma. And then we integrate over mt. So it's a, it's a long computation, um, but uh, so basically what do we have here? We have uh, all terms uh, with um, two derivatives, uh, so I, uh, except for the ones that come from here. And um, so let us call this expression Z, so it's the only expression without derivatives. So the, so the point is that we, so, I single out the term with z here. Um, recall, um, uh, so f contained in a term, so La Laplace f contains uh, La Laplace a square over h2 minus sigma. So here, the only term with uh, no derivatives uh, is uh, f plus over p uh, over, uh, f plus to the p over h to the sigma times um, h2 minus sigma, the denominator, and then here we have uh, uh, 2 times z. So what we obtain is uh, a term like this. Uh, 
is equal to stuff with uh, derivatives. Um, so in, in all these terms, you either have uh, so something like that, for instance, a, with um, um, square of a gradient, uh, uh, or you have uh, second derivatives like uh, here or like here. So where you have second derivatives, you integrate by parts uh, in order to find again uh, product of two first derivatives. And uh, where you have this product, you can uh, use Schwarz inequality to say that the product of two derivatives is less than the square of the first one plus the square of the second one. So by using uh, integration by parts uh, and um, uh, so standard uh, uh, computations, you, you find that this is uh, less than uh, something with uh, gradient f square plus something with um, gradient h square plus something with gradient a square. But um, um, yeah, in uh, OK. But yeah, gradient a square can also be somehow turned in some gradient f. So this can be, um, you, you can get rid of these terms. And um, therefore, you are left with something which we can estimate in principle. Of course, uh, um, I'm not, uh, I'm skipping the details, so uh, things are technically more complicated than I'm saying now. But so what's the use of this? I have that. This expression can be estimated by my terms here, while I would like this expression to be estimated. So my question is, um, what's the relation of this and this? So I want uh, this to be larger than the one there. So you see that uh, we have a factor f plus over p in both uh, cases. So what we need, uh, need to show that uh, um, that Z is um, Z over H square greater than uh, um, greater than or equal to uh, some, some constant times um, h square, uh, a square. And um, this was, um, was true, uh, so a similar step was in Huisken's paper for, on convex hypersurfaces, and in the case of convex hypersurfaces, this was true. So let's see what's, uh, how things are in our case. So one can compute, uh, that um, for when we have only two curvatures, Z uh, is equal to lambda one, lambda two times the product, uh, times the, um, the square of the difference. Uh, so uh, you see that um, the, the inequality that was in the uh, convex case um, um, that does not hold because uh, this means that this is negative if uh, z is equal to, if uh, f is greater than zero. Um, but the, mm, so when we first saw this, uh, we said, well, um, it's no problem that z is negative uh, because um, this argument here, we can work the same argument with a negative sign. So let's estimate minus z instead of z. The, um, 
the same computation goes through because uh, so at the end we have uh, maybe some scalar product with, where we estimate by the, the modulus. Uh, so the, in maybe some good term become bad, some bad term become, become good, but what we find at the, the end is again something like this. So it's, um, it's the same if you can prove this inequality. But this inequality holds true because this, um, um, you recall, if, um, if f is greater than 0, then um, 2 lambda 1, lambda 2 uh, is, uh, so minus 2 lambda 1, lambda 2 is uh, a square minus h square. And this is um, uh, greater than uh, eta h square. So this is um, in uh, modulus, in absolute values, greater than eta h square. And lambda 1 minus lambda 2 um, Let me write it in this way. Lambda 2 minus lambda 1. Lambda 1 is negative at points where f is 0. Um, so this is equal to uh, h minus 2 lambda 1. Lambda 1 is negative, so this is greater than h. So this means that minus z is greater than, um, this is greater than eta h square, and this is greater than h square. Uh, so minus uh, zeta over h square is greater than uh, eta h, eta h square, and uh, h square, you know, it's greater than uh, uh, eta over c0, a square. So this is uh, exactly what we needed, and uh, the constant, uh, of course, will depend on eta. And so th this means that uh, it's true that um, this term um, so, has hope to be absorbed by this one. And um, so with um, some computation, we can show that this is less than or equal to 0. If uh, p is large enough and uh, sigma is um, smaller than uh, uh, a suitable constant times uh, the inverse of square root of p. And, uh, okay. Okay, so um, this shows that we have um, monotonicity of the LP norms. And now we need to pass from um, an LP estimate for um, uh, large enough P to an infinity estimate. Also, there is some, uh, uh, one has to be careful because um, sigma depends on P. So we do not have a, a fixed function whose LP norm is monotone for every large P but uh, we have to adjust sigma in order to have something monotone. So the, um, the thing is delicate. But uh, so now there comes the most technical part of uh, the proof, but uh, the, the final part is really um, was already done in the first paper by Huisken. Uh, one use, uh, so from, uh, to pass uh, from LP bound to L infinity bound on F, uh, one uses um, um, an uh, iteration technique uh, uh, 
Well, there are various techni iteration techniques on integral estimates uh, due to the George e. Moser, but the, the one Huiskan was using in his first paper is uh, basically due to Stampacchia. A crucial point in, the, in the, this procedure is um, the use of a uh, Sobolev inequality on manifolds due to Michael and Simon. And there are interpolation for LP spaces and um, to just to give you a small flavor of the technique, one um, studies the truncated function, which is, I think, typical uh, technique by Stampacchia. One uh, defines, uh, given a positive number k, one defines uh, vk as the maximum of um, our function f, minus k and zero. So you only, you, you somehow turn down your function by a, uh, so you only look at your function where it is greater than some value k and uh, this becomes your zero level and so what happens below, you don't care, you only see what happens above. The idea is, um, showing that f is bounded is equivalent to saying that this vk is uh, identically zero if k is large enough. And um, you call uh, akt the set um, uh, where um, on the manifold where um, the um, where vk is um, uh, greater than zero, so where uh, our function is greater than k. And uh, the final step of the, this iteration uh, technique that I'm not, to, not going to, um, to say the more than this, uh, I will uh, shows that for suitable um, fixed values of uh, p and sigma, one finds uh, this relation that uh, um, for any suitable large pair of uh, positive numbers, uh, h greater than k, you can compare the, um, the measure on uh, throughout all the life of our hypersurface of these sets, and we have this that um, the, um, so capital T is the singular time. So you integrate over the time interval uh, where the solution exists, the uh, area of the sets. This is the set with h, so with a larger value. And um, you can see that uh, one can prove that this is uh, greater than, uh, is less than some constant times uh, the same, um, so the MDT times the same uh, uh, object for the, the lower value. But this time there is an exponent gamma for uh, a suitable uh, gamma minus one. And um, so these sort of inequalities are common in these uh, iteration techniques. Uh, there is an elementary lemma by Stampacchia, 
which shows that uh, if, uh, if we consider this as a function of uh, a real valued function evaluated in k and h, uh, Stapakia showed that this inequality implies that this function becomes zero in finite time. has to decay so fast that uh, it has to reach zero um, for a finite value. There exists some um, k bar k such that uh, <coughs> is equal to zero, but um, so this uh, means that uh, the, um, this set is uh, empty for every t, then, which means that uh, uh, f is greater than or equal to k uh, on uh, mt for every t. And as I was telling you yesterday, this, uh, this is the conclusion, because if f is uh, bounded from above, then uh, um, this implies the convexity estimate in this case. Okay, so, so that part is, um, uh, if you read the, the, the paper, is quite uh, technical. Uh, so um, some um, people working in uh, this area uh, usually like to find alternative proof, if possible, which avoid this part. But um, uh, while it is technical, on the other hand, uh, it's... Uh, uh, like a black box that you can you can use. Uh, you, you know that when you have some ingredients, uh, some estimates uh, to start with, uh, you can apply basically the same proof every time. So once you understand this, you can apply this uh, with with little changes. And in fact, uh, although the Original results have found alternative proofs. Uh, you see again and again uh, recent papers uh, which uh, use this uh, integral iteration uh, technique to find uh, uh, estimates from above on suitable quantities because in, uh, there are new problems where you see that uh, this is a useful technique. So this um, is uh, somehow the, the simpler case where n is equal to 2. And let me give you just a brief sketch of um, what do you do for um, um, higher dimension. What if uh, n is uh, greater than 2? Then the, um, the function we have just used with a square and h square is uh, not enough. Uh, one can, can make the same. Uh, trick, but you would not find convexity. You would just find that uh, um, the scalar curvature becomes asymptotically you know, negative, but this does not imply convexity, asymptotic convexity. Then what you use uh, is um, what, what we did in the original proof. We considered the um, elementary symmetric polynomials which are the product uh, of uh, different uh, k curvatures in particular s1 is equal to h sn is equal to gauss uh, curvature And uh, some important, they, these uh, polynomials have many important properties. Um, for instance, uh, all curvatures are uh, positive if and only if uh, uh, all symmetric polynomials are positive. K From one over uh, from one to n. So we um, to to prove the convexity estimate for general n, we want to prove that uh, uh, 
s k so for every eta there exists a c eta such that uh, s k is greater than uh, this quantity c k eta So k equal one, uh, uh, sk is s1, so the mean curvature which is uh, positive. We want to show that the other ones uh, are not necessarily positive but satisfy an estimate like this from below. And um, we do this um, by induction. SK is greater than uh, minus eta times the, the previous one times H. Um, so K equal one, uh, uh, this is true with the zero. K equal two, uh, this becomes um, H square and it's basically the proof that we have already done. And uh, to pass, to continue the induction up to k equal to n, um, you, we use the function like this. So again, this is something scale invariant up to this uh, h to the sigma. And um, yeah, with a, with a minus because we want to prove that this is less than some constant. So it's, um, it's uh, analogous to what we, we did before, so bound uh, prove that, uh, that F is bounded from above. And the, the, good, the, the reason for using these polynomials is that um, this expression is, uh, is a concave uh, function of uh, lambda i. This property was well known uh, uh, it was, um, some people had studied before um, um, elliptic equation involving these terms. Uh, um, so ellip these terms evaluated in the Hessian of, uh, of some uh, unknown function. So there were works by uh, Trudinger or by Caffarelli, Niederberg, and Sprague using those functions. So those properties were well known. And the, this concavity is crucial to yield uh, properties similar to the one we have exploited in the proof for the n equal to case. Uh, but there is a problem, uh, if you see the definition I've done, that uh, you see that in the induction step, you, we don't show that the kth polynomial is uh, positive. So we just bound its negative part. So this denominator can vanish. So if I write it in this way, this does not, uh, is not well defined. So the real definition is um, some perturbed quantities. So SK are uh, evaluated in uh, some perturbed eigenvalues uh, lambda i tilde, which are the real ones plus uh, some uh, perturbation. Um, I'm cheating here a bit is, uh, This is not the same eta of the estimate we have to prove. Uh, it's uh, some other small value, but related to this uh, 
to this eta. So we, somehow the induction step, the, the fact that SK minus one satisfies the corresponding estimate uh, shows that SK minus one is um, close to being positive. So if we increase a bit, so with a small h uh, eta prime and with a big c eta prime, then sk minus one becomes positive because of the previous step. So this function is well defined. Uh, since we have done the perturbation, there will be some additional uh, uh, term in the equation that we will have to handle, but uh, um, this can be estimated by the fact that what we are adding is uh, something plus uh, times a, a small constant plus something of lower order in the curvature, and we are only going to prove estimates which become significant when the curvature is large. And so we can use a similar technique to, to this one. Um, there have been uh, more recently simpler proof of this property. So there is a, so the proof by Haselhofer and Kleiner which uses uh, some um, uh, shorter but less direct uh, argument uh, based on the non-collapsing property. And by using similar ideas but um, so it's basically possible to prove convexity without uh, induction, so in a single blow. Uh, there is, for instance, a paper by uh, Matt Langford uh, appeared uh, recently on uh, calculus of variation called the general pinching principle where, um, so we, we looked for this function somehow by making uh, guess what a function could be which has good properties. But it's possible to work in a more abstract way. That is, I'm to, in order to prove these properties, I want a certain function of the eigenvalues uh, which uh, has some properties, which is concave, which is uh, uh, positive in a certain set, negative in some other set. So I can, one can construct such a function in a more abstract way using the distance function in the space of uh, matrices uh, and um, in this way, so in a, rather than using the specific properties of this function, one can work more abstractly and uh, find uh, the, the result in a shorter way. Okay, so um, this uh, was uh, my sketch of the proof of the convexity estimates. And uh, so what's the conclusion for the, um, for the analysis of singularities. This is something that Gerard has already um, mentioned in, the, uh, in his lectures, but I can um, say it in more detail now. Um, so the so classifications, uh, classification of uh, blow-up limits. The blow-up limits is the procedure that um, Gerard has described, uh, uh, what, what he called the, the, the second procedure, that we consider a family of rescaled flow. You consider a suitable function of points in space and time approaching uh, uh, a singular time. We, we, you take suitably these points such that they maximize the curvature. Uh, for previous time and possibly mm, also compared with some later times. And um, so you make a parabolic rescaling of the flow, so you obtain a family of rescaled flow which has a uniformly bounded curvature and which converges to an ancient solution. So uh, by rescaling uh, around uh, some family of uh, points uh, such that uh, so a square of uh, pk, pk goes to infinity, t, 
quantity k, of course, goes to t. Uh, so the, this classification, uh, I stress that it's uh, confined to the, the case of uh, mean convex hypersurfaces. Uh, then uh, there is a limit uh, uh, m tilde t, which uh, for type 1 is an ancient solution. So t in uh, minus infinity is um, t0. And for type 2 is an eternal solution. So type 1, uh, you know already by Huiskens lecture, the monotonicity formula uh, implies that the mt is, um, m tilde t is uh, uh, homothetic. And using uh, positive mean curvature, you see that m tilde t can only be uh, a sphere or a cylinder. So I just say SN, I should say a family of SN with radius going to zero, a cylinder. Uh, SK times uh, R, Rn minus K, or this um, abrash Langer uh, type, uh, like uh, so gamma. abrash Langer are homothetic curves uh, in the plane uh, with the self intersection which uh, shrink homothetically, so if you take the product, uh, but they, they only exist in, uh, in one dimension, so it's uh, something like this. Uh, so this was already said by Gerard, and, uh, but the, the case of type two, the monotonicity formula does not give um, um, information because the um, blow up rate of the curvature is too large. For type two, so what can we say? Well, the, um, we can say the convexity estimates uh, imply that m tilde t is um, uh, convex. This uh, does not have to do with the type 2. This is true in both cases, but in the, the other case, uh, you already know, we already knew that it was convex also without a convexity estimate. But now we, we exploit this property. Well, um, I underline convex in this case uh, does not mean necessarily strictly convex. You see, for instance, you can get cylinders. Um, well, then there is a, a sort of a strong maximum principle by Hamilton, you know that convexity is uh, an invariant property because uh, the second fundamental form uh, satisfies um, a maximum principle for uh, tensors. So if it starts uh, positive, it remains positive. Um, you, uh, so for scalar functions, you know that um, scalar function with this property either is uh, strictly positive all the time or it is uh, identically zero all the times. For um, um, tensors, you have something like, um, um, so the alternative of being uh, strictly positive all the times uh, is uh, uh, having uh, the same rank all the times uh, and um, the kernel is, um, is a parallel uh, uh, section of the, the, um, uh, of the tangent bundle. And this uh, implies that there is a splitting. 
So Hamilton strong maximum principle implies that uh, m tilde t can be written as the product of some nk t tam, times r n minus k with uh, this uh, strictly convex. Uh, the, the typical example would be this, uh, strictly convex times a uh, flat factor. So we have something uh, strictly convex and uh, eternal. And there is this um, other result by Hamilton. If um, so theorem if um, n t is uh, eternal strictly convex and uh, h assumes uh, its maximum at some point um, of course e eternal cannot be uh, compact so it's non compact so the fact that the curvature assumes its maximum is non trivial um, then uh, uh, nt is uh, translating soliton And um, so uh, a, a hypersurface which uh, up to reparameterization moves by translating, like, uh, you know, these examples that Gerard uh, told you. And uh, so does uh, our uh, n tilde satisfy this uh, assumption? Well, yes, because um, this follows from the... Um, from the rescaling procedure. We always rescale uh, around, uh, so the, this rescaling is done around points where we have a maximum of the curvature. So also the rescaled function will, the rescaled hypersurface will have a maximum at the, the center of our rescaling. So that the limit will, will have a, a maximum of the curvature, so this is uh, okay for us. So, um, this means, uh, which is, is a translating soliton, uh, translating solution. So when we <laughs> did this result, um, it was not yet clear uh, what are the translating uh, solutions, so whether, so we, it is easy to see that there is a, a rotationally symmetric one. So in one dimension, the only translating soliton is the Grim Reaper curve. Why, uh, yeah, this function. In um, higher dimension, the, the question is, um, is uh, not easy. For a long time, it was uh, not known whether all uh, solitons are uh, rotationally symmetric or not. And then there was a paper by uh, Suja Wang who somehow showed that uh, in a higher dimension, there are many translating solutions but um, only one is relevant in this case. 
So for um, k greater than or equal to 2, uh, convex um, translating solutions are uh, uh, not unique, but the only one uh, uh, with uh, uh, which is uh, non-collapsed is uh, the rotationally symmetric one. called uh, the bowl, which um, looks uh, much like a paraboloid. So it's not exactly a paraboloid, but it's um, asymptotic to a paraboloid. And so contrast with the Grim Reaper, the Grim Reaper is confined in a strip. This opens up more and more, but like a paraboloid with a higher and higher slope. Uh, so it means that you, so at each point you can find uh, uh, a ball inside with radius um, compared to the inverse of the curvature. For instance, the Grim Reaper is collapsed because uh, the curvature here becomes uh, smaller and smaller, but the radius of the ball uh, cannot exceed uh, a given value. In, uh, for these um, functions, you can see that they are non-collapsed. So the, it's also here the, um, the curvature decreases, but since they are opening up, you, you compute that you find enough space to uh, have a, a sphere inside with radius um, Uh, so the, the, other, the other translating solutions uh, become um, more narrow in some direction. So they, uh, they become a bit like, like a product of uh, something like this times something flat, and this gives, uh, again, uh, collapsing. So this was proved by, basically was already contained in a paper by Suja Wang, uh, and uh, more recently, it's, um, there is some result by Simon Brendle showing this uh, in a more um, explicit and precise way. Okay, and um, maybe I, so, so this was the classification of the um, of the possible profiles. Uh, and uh, in the last lecture, I will uh, speak um, about the surgery procedure we did with uh, Gerard for uh, a higher dimension in the class of hypersurfaces called the two convex. In the remaining minutes, uh, I would um, like to say something more about this uh, result by Hamilton, which um, is a um, consequence uh, of a very important estimate for the um, mean curvature flow, which is uh, parallel to um, another estimate for the Ricci flow, which Hamilton called the Harnack differential inequality. Differential Harnack, maybe. Oh, that's. And um, uh, in fact, is. Um, 
classification, his uh, statement that um, eternal convex uh, has to be translating is a consequence of uh, this because um, somehow shows that uh, uh, an um, eternal convex uh, attaining the maximum at some point must satisfy the equality case uh, in uh, some uh, maximum principle argument, so by strong maximum principle has a certain rigidity which implies uh, that uh, it is a translating solution. The, um, the proof uh, is not easy to say in a few words, but um, I would like to say something about this because I think it's a very interesting topic in itself. Well, if you have a PD background, you, sure, you certainly have heard uh, about Harnack inequalities, but this um, name differential may be um, new to you. So Harnack inequality uh, is a, a standard class of result, uh, type of results for elliptic and parabolic equations. So for elliptic equations, for instance, uh, you, it says that uh, under certain hypotheses, uh, positive solutions of um, uh, elliptic equation in a given domain uh, satisfy some, um, uh, in every compact subset, there is uh, some uh, bound between the maximum and the, and the minimum. So the maximum cannot be arbitrarily larger than the minimum. And for um, parabolic equations, there are similar Harnack inequalities uh, in a certain uh, compact subdomain of some domain where, let's say, the heat equation or some more general parabolic equation hold. You have um, a bound between the, the maximum and the minimum, but it goes only in one direction in time. Uh, somehow it says that um, the... Um, the, the, the minimum at a later time cannot be too smaller than the maximum at previous times. And there was a, a famous paper by Li and Yao, which uh, established the um, connection between some uh, differential inequalities uh, satisfied by the solutions of uh, parabolic PDEs. And the classical uh, Harnack inequality. Basically, you, you have this differential inequality then you use this inequality to estimate the difference of the solution at two different points by integrating along a, a curve in space-time joining these two points. Uh, when you compute the derivative of the solution along this uh, curve, you apply this inequality and you find a bound on the possible change of the solution between the two points. So um, Hamilton, in his papers, called these inequalities just differential Harnack inequalities. But to explain this background, some authors uh, uh, have called them uh, um, Lee, Yao, Hamilton, Harnack inequalities, so with the uh, acronym L-Y-H-H. -H. Uh, and uh, well, maybe I don't have time to say more about this now, but maybe I, I will say some word at the beginning of the lecture of this afternoon. Uh, let me remind you again that we have uh, switched um, the order of this afternoon with, uh, Toti, um, with respect to the original program. I will uh, give the lecture at uh, 2 p.m. while uh, Toti Daskalopoulos will uh, give the last lecture at uh, a quarter to four. So thank you for your attention and I uh, will meet again this afternoon. <laughs>